light a little bit more uh, of the flame, the pilot light of belief in humanity that you already have uh, in engaging you into the different dimensions of attempting to eradicate the use of a very sophisticated low technology weapon system called the child soldier that really came into the fore in the late 80s. Before I do that, and because of the introduction particularly, uh, I would like, if I may impose upon you, to request that you recognize um, a colleague of mine and his uh, daughter who are here. In uh, 1994, as it will come out a bit in the presentation, um, and as the subtitle of my book says, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda, the world essentially abandoned uh, Rwanda, and the world abandoned the UN, uh, for it emasculated the UN in its ability to respond to the genocide. I say that because we often blame the UN for the Rwandan genocide, and there is no doubt that in the field we made mistakes at the Secretariat, there were mistakes made, and also at the Security Council. But the real heart of the mistake uh, is not in that structure, but it is in the individual sovereign states and in their capitals, where their governments deliberately decided not to give the UN the capacity to be able to bring in a new mandate, to send in reinforcements, to stop the genocide in its tracks, and ultimately stop the genocide as it went on for another three months. We, the individual sovereign states, decided not to give in the field and in New York the ability to stop it, let alone were we interested in preventing it. For the mission never got a budget, and we were the lowest priority of the 15 UN missions at the time, the big ones being Yugoslavia, big ones being Cambodia, uh, and Haiti was just starting, starting up again. And so uh, there's a lot of mea culpa in the world structures uh, to uh, the fact that the UN was unable to take that leadership role and that in the field we essentially were abandoned. Except for one country who at times I have debated why it did get involved. The country is this country, Canada. Although I had asked for a battalion, which is about a thousand troops to come in, uh, the response was no because we were already committed to Yugoslavia and uh, people felt that that was enough. But when all the other forces, except for a few hundred Ghanaians and a few others, when all the others had abandoned us, I asked for 12 officers to come and replace those who left in order to keep my headquarters together right at the start of a time when it should have been fully functional, meaning at the time when the Civil War started and the genocide. So after everybody pulled out, Canada responded and sent me 11 officers and I already had one on the ground. And they were the core of the 450 that were able to keep about 30,000 people alive and reasonably safe, the negotiations ongoing, uh, the attempts at ceasefire, the coordination of the whole non-government humanitarian effort that came in subsequently, and ultimately be the element there for when finally the world decided to come in and they did that when the war was ended and not when it was still ongoing. Canada also provided me with two Hercules aircraft that permitted the only lifeline into Rwanda during the genocide. No other country in the world wanted to fly in. No civilian company wanted to fly in. 
and the two Canadian Hercules aircraft based out of Nairobi were flying in under fire, took a lot of hits, uh, and they were the only lifeline we had uh, to get some food in, some medical supplies, and get my casualties out. One of those officers uh, who came in with a few days' notice uh, into the most horrific uh, genocide of the ending of the 20th century he lives here in Calgary, is here, and he, like I, are both injured by the traumas of what we've lived through. And he is uh, Major Jean-Yves Saint-Denis, who's here. So Jean-Yves, je suppose que tu es assis là. Lève-toi bon. that's all we got. That's all we got. We got nothing else. We ran out of food, fuel, and essentially the UN, the answer I got was the cavalry is not coming over the hill uh, and in fact uh, you're on your own. But worse than that is that we also got the last few of us left we also got a legal order that was an immoral order. And this is sort of a segue into the subject that we're going to talk on, on child soldiers, because they were all over the place, on both sides. They used youths under 18 uh, in that conflict, both to slaughter and to fight the Civil War. I got an order when everybody else had left except for the few 450 that were there, the Secretary General of the UN called me up. There was only one phone in the whole country working. And he said, we have intelligence information uh, that uh, there's a force coming and it's going to wipe out your whole force. Uh, and they're going to particularly target your headquarters. Where we had some of the people who were uh, under threat, uh, under our protection. And he said, the UN has already lost uh, by then 11 uh, peacekeepers. It can't handle losing more peacekeepers. And so I'm ordering you to abandon the mission, to pull out immediately. Now by then, the third week or the fourth week, we've estimated over 250,000 Rwandans had been slaughtered let alone half a million who had been internally displaced and it was ongoing. But 11 peacekeepers had been killed and the world would not be able to handle it, that more peacekeepers would be killed. And so he ordered me to abandon the mission, to pull out. And by instinct, my answer was no. So he repeated it. And I said, no again. And then, and not to be too vulgar, he was quite pissed off, so he hung up the phone. <laughs> not used to getting an answer from a general, him, the Secretary General of the UN, that overtly and quite deliberately tells him to go stuff himself. <laughs> he called back about 10 minutes later and questioned me again. And I said, no, we are not going to pull out. I went to the Ghanaian general who was my deputy to confirm that his troops were prepared to stay and he was ready, Ghana, was ready to keep his troops on the ground even with that risk. Now the order was legal. We had a mandate, we, it was non-existent anymore, it was supposed to be peacekeeping, we were at war, we didn't have any resources, we knew we were being targeted by then the ex-colonial powers had found out the extremists were going to take us out in order to conduct the genocide. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, in legal terms, uh, should have been ordered to be pulled out because we didn't have that mandate anymore. But the order was immoral because by then we had close to 30,000 Rwandans from both sides 
under our protection, that small force. And we had already seen one of our uh, contingents pull out of one of these positions too soon at the start of the war, and the 4,000 people that were there were slaughtered within hours. And so if we hadn't pulled out, we would have seen the outright slaughter by one side and the other of those 30,000 people. And although for the months ahead we didn't have water and medical supplies and we saw them dying, we still saved a group of them. And so we enter an era of enormous complexity and ambiguity by stumbling through it and facing these ethical, moral, and legal dilemmas, which brings to us a conclusion of whether or not when we're getting these mandates and getting these orders, whether in fact the political elites of the world, as they express themselves through their capital, their own governments, and through international organizations like the UN or NATO, whether they actually believe that all humans are human, or whether they believe that their humans are more human than the others, that their humans have more a reason to be than the others, and in so doing, skew completely the reason why we are there in the first place, to assist in preventing conflicts, civil war, massive abuses of human rights, genocide, to protect. And that sort of dilemma that is evolving still within the political elites is why we're fiddling in Darfur eight years later, why we're still inept in the Congo, why we're not preventing a catastrophic failure in southern Sudan uh, as the pressures continue to mount with northern Sudan, that new country, and a series of other countries, and why we haven't really responded to Libya. We've sort of tacitly given a hand when we know that those rebels would be massively massacred, why we're not into Syria, why we don't even want to fiddle with other countries, because we're hedging our bets, because we have an assessment of humanity that is unethical in our argument regarding human rights. Human rights is for every human being, not just for those who can afford a lawyer. Either all humans are equal, or they are not. And if they are not, then you cannot stand as a government, as a society, and say that you believe fundamentally, as a premise of your being a human, that other humans are just as human as you. And let me give you one small example. About halfway through the genocide, we ended up being able to negotiate uh, the movement of people between the lines who are held behind the rebel lines and the other behind the government lines uh, that we had under our protection. And so as I'm going through no man's land between the two forces that are there, I'm driving down the road, there's a little boy about 300 meters ahead in the middle of the road where there should be no one. Now, the extremists were using young children to block the humanitarian convoys. And the kids would have to stay there. If not, they'd kill them. And the convoys would stop, and then the extremists would simply steal, ambush, kill to get the medical supplies, the water, uh, the food. So I expecting that this was an ambush, I slowed down. We jumped out, I had a couple soldiers with me, looked around, no ambush. Went to the huts along the little road, looked for people, nobody was left alive, they had all been slaughtered weeks beforehand. And as we're looking for somebody to take care of this little boy, in the middle of nowhere, we lose the boy. So we're doubling back and we find him in a hut where there are two adults, male, female, couple children, half eaten by dogs and rats. And he's sitting there, as if he's at home. 
So I picked them up and I brought them in front of my vehicle and I looked at them. His stomach was bloated, he was mangy, he was dirty, he was in rags, there was flies all around him. But then I looked into his eyes. And what I saw in the eyes of that five, six-year-old boy, in the middle of that genocide, living amongst those corpses and rats and wild dogs, what I saw in his eyes was exactly what I saw in the eyes of my six-year-old son when I left for Africa. They were the eyes of a human child and they were exactly the same. That little boy was just as human as my son at home. And although we react in such a deliberate fashion in our societies when we have such a thing as an Amber Alert, how is it that we've permitted the world to have over 30 conflicts around there where the primary weapon system is a child mostly under the age of 15? And we're not intervening. We're not even trying to prevent those catastrophes, let alone trying to stop them. The best we're doing is we're picking up the pieces of those who are surviving and trying through rehabilitation and reintegration to bring them back into their societies. We haven't stopped the massive proliferation of small arms that make them so effective that at the end of the Cold War, we didn't destroy, they just sold them off. And there are over 600 million light weapons around the world. And they're, they're durable for decades, if not a century. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've stumbled into an era that's complex, that's ambiguous, that the answers are often at odds with what we believe in, that we find ourselves faced with these constant dilemmas of what the right thing to do. Should we, should we not? Who's the good guy, who's the bad guy? And what should our engagement be? How much do we give of ourselves, not only in cash, but in sweat, in tears, and yes, in some of the blood of our youth, to go and provide protection for those who are being massively abused in their human rights uh, in those failing states. We've paid that price before for ourselves. I'm going to throw out a number, 2017. What if I say the year 2017? <coughs> well, I asked the same question in caucus three years ago. I said, what's going to be special about that? 2017 is going to be the 150th anniversary of this extraordinary democracy of this absolutely incredible nation state that has come nowhere near maximizing its potential in the world. And anybody who says we punch over our weight hasn't got a clue of what is real of this nation and what it can do. So it's going to be the 150th anniversary of our nation, but it's also going to be the 100th anniversary when hundreds of thousands of our youths, in fact, nearly 600,000, crossed that big pond, fought, bled, died, and won a major victory in World War I called Vimy Ridge, and permitted this young nation to be recognized by all the nation states in the world as being a sovereign nation state, having won it in the blood of its youth. Those were the criteria, the old sort of overt criteria of nation states. And so you've got the year 2017, where you're the 150th anniversary of the establishment of this democracy and its system of governance, and then you've got the 100th anniversary where it actually came to the fore in the world at the, at the cost of the blood of its youth and so much suffering. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what's the plan? I mean, what do we got planned? 
that's going to culminate in 2017. A whole bunch of more centennial rinks. We got more centennial rinks since Carter's got liver pills. <laughs> or more centennial parks. Or more decibels. Or what the hell? No, what's out there? What do we want to bring to culmination as this great nation to recognize its past, the power of its past, as a launching pad potentially for its future, or a culmination of what we've been? Let me put it another way. What is going to be the Canada post-2017? What do we want to be in that new era? What are we going to launch? What will be the vision of Canada in the world? What sort of strategic guidance are we going to give to the incredible power of our youth in order to move it to maximize its extraordinary potential and influence significantly humanity out there? We can't even figure out that maybe we need a four-lane highway across this country. I throw just a simple example. If we're just looking inward, as in the last election, the previous election, and the one previous to that, federally, we have not at all talked about Canada and the world and the vision we want to give to our youth. We've sort of looked at self-interest, we looked at local requirements. In fact, we've started to argue for strong regions, but we sort of left out the reason why we want strong regions in this country. We didn't say we want strong regions in order to, as a Kennedy-esque way of, of coalescing, of creating a synergy of these strong regions to create a much more capable country for it to be able to be more effective. We didn't say that part. We just said strong regions. So we've seen ourselves being turned inward and in fact being sort of split up and, and, and sort of in friction with one another versus trying to build up these regions to bring them together for a higher cause. One of the th th things I threw out uh, at the caucus was they talk about a high-speed train between Quebec and Windsor, the Quebec Windsor corridor, as if this is sort of like Paris and France. You know, in French we say non brides monde, the, the sort of the belly button of the world. You know, why not have a high speed train started in 2017 from Halifax to Vancouver? So if it takes 40 years, so what? Nobody said we're going to close down in 50. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are in an era where we are demanding that we see beyond our borders, that we speak of global initiatives and global problems, that we've created revolutions for our youth, and yet we're holding them back. We're stymieing them back. And I'm trying to try to give you an example of how to break out of that code. And what I'm going to do is because I'm a soldier, I'm not an academic, we're very visual people. You know, the soldiers, uh, you rarely see an officer without a map. But the soldiers hope is that it's the map of the area in which they're in, but then it's... <laughs> and so I decided to cut down because of time, because I want to leave a bunch of time for questions. I've only brought 143 slides this morning. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what my Marine Corps friends taught me uh, when I spent time with them, is I'm going to I'm going to power talk. So this is not going to be a lunch time where I think you're going to have a chance to fall asleep. And if you do and you snore, don't worry about it. I'm an artillery officer. I won't be able to hear you anyways. <laughs> so let's get into the subject of the use of children. Right? The use of children, of army children. Not to be the odd little soldier on the side as we sort of nearly uh, sort of uh, symbolically show the drummer boy of the 19th century with the red scarlet unit regiments fighting their way through the, the, uh, the uh, British Empire and so on. I'm talking about using boys and girls under 18, many and the bulk under 15, arming them and making them the primary instrument by which these countries are waging war, civil wars, 
conflicts and by which they are destroying millions of people's lives and in fact slaughtering hundreds of thousands. And if that's not a weapon of mass destruction, I don't know what is. And so how do we stop the use of that? And how in fact do we see that future in trying to, to do that? I was wondering if there was any gin, but there are. Thank you very much. <laughs> As I often say, since I've been sitting in the Senate, if, if, um, if our John A. McDonald, our first prime minister, could run the country with a glass of gin on his desk all the time, why can't we every now and again indulge? But anyways, <laughs> this here is a, a, a statement by a great American philosopher. <laughs> He said that 60 years ago. He said that because women were in the workforce, it was post-World War II. He just didn't see things coming anymore. They weren't evolving, you know, they weren't just changing on the peripheral and getting a little better. He, th he, saw, he saw change as something significant. That's nothing compared to what's going on today. We are not in a time of change, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why we seem to be always in crisis management mode and reacting mode, is because we're in a time of revolutions. And if you've got a retired general who's talking about revolutions, don't worry too much about it. However, should you see anybody in uniform talk about that, you throw them in jail right away. <laughs> we are at a time when we are in revolutionary time frames, and that revolution is in our face. When I graduated from military college, an old colonel asked me, what do you want to do into the future? To me, that meant 20 years down the road. What do I want to be when I'm old at 45? <laughs> Today, the future is five years, six years, seven years. Undergrads are going to graduate, and stuff is going to change socially, technology-wise, and the whole infrastructure is in constant flux. And so we are then caught up in a time where it's getting pretty difficult to anticipate what's coming, to try to figure out how to handle it. And imagine if you're part of the leadership structure of a nation, of an organization. If you're continuously in crisis mode, well, crisis management is not shaping the future. Crisis management is surviving the future. Can, in fact, humanity continue to thrive if its whole world structure is doing nothing more than trying to survive. Who is running the future? Who is anticipating the future? Who is shaping the future? Some of you are involved in different areas or you get involved in business areas and they'll say, we've got a five-year plan. See, for a five-year, or you watch the budget, right? We've got a budget out there every year that comes out every year and it's a five-year budget. And we all vote on it and discuss it and stuff like that. When you look at these budgets, the first year is very tight. I mean, they got every sort of quarter sort of lined up. And then the second year, well, there's a bit of flexibility. The third year, it's a little grayer. Fourth year, uh, fifth year is getting a pretty flaky. <laughs> so in the discussions, I sit in the Senate, and we, in the open forum that we have, uh, when a bill is presented, uh, for final reading, I stood up and I asked the question, if this is the five-year plan of our budget, who's working on year six? What is the input coming in for next year, year six? And how is that being structured? I mean, how is that being focused? Or do we simply start again next year with a five-year plan with year six appearing? And we'll invent something or we've deferred something. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our future is in our face, and the youth of this nation are starting to realize that, and the revolution of technology is making them that much more aware. And what some of us attempted to do in this last election is to make the youth of this nation realize that they hold the balance of power. I'm a soldier. I went into the artillery because it's got big guns, and I like power. It was very, very basic instinct at the time. But power, power to make policy, power to influence public opinion, power to lead 
nations and the world and international organizations. Those under the age of 30, I used 30 because that's a, we never used to trust anybody about 30 anyways when we were young, but those between 18 and 30 represent 35% of the voting population in this country. Yet in the last election, it varied between 15 and 25% of them voted. That means there are millions of votes that were never tabulated, have never ever been tabulated because this is a historic trend. However, there are some MPs who are elected with less than 50 votes. That means if the class of Professor Smorgensborg decided to vote for a certain MP, they could have beaten the guy who won. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the youth of this nation have power. They can change the face of politics in one election if they coalesce and they focus behind a leader, create a party, create a new demand. And they've got the tools to do it. And that's why we have got to get them engaged, turn them into activists, give them a bit of focus, big boundaries, and let them go for it. And they are oh so willing to do so. And in the end, I argue that it, there should be, in order to give a sort of an instilling will in our youth to engage as part of citizens of an extraordinary country like ours, is that there should be a rite of passage after high school or technical school or, or, or undergraduate degree. There should be a rite of passage for our youth into the adulthood of, of our country by having under your bed a pair of boots that have been sullied in the earth of the developing country, where they have gone to see, hear, smell, taste, touch what is happening to 80% of humanity a week, a month, a year, and bring that reality of humanity back to this extraordinary country and let that influence them, which it will for the rest of their lives. And that's the engagement we're trying to sort of offer in looking at one of the most horrific sins against humanity, which is the use of children by adults to fight, to kill, to die for causes of which they don't even have any, any concept of what it is, for they are not even adults, they are still children. So, in this revolutionary time, I'm gonna make sure I the screen, yeah. Here, I'm gonna very rapidly gonna throw up a few revolutions that you're facing in order to set the scene. The first one is the environmental one, and we're just starting that one. I mean, that's just starting. We just barely started. I mean, what's the aim? Is the aim to hopefully that humanity is gonna survive on this planet in the future? Or is the aim for humanity to thrive into the future. And if it is to thrive, then what are the policies, the ways we gotta change to meet that? And it's interesting that a young boy just south of Winnipeg, a grade 11 student, asked me a question after a presentation. He said, are there still nuclear weapons? And I said, yes, I, I know they're demobilizing. He said, well, why are we worried about oil spills and plastic bags if we can wipe out the whole surface of the earth? So I looked into it. It's about five years ago. And I found a pug wash. You ever seen one? Mm -mm. You didn't know you were coming to a class here. <laughs> Some of the students are getting a half credit, I think. <laughs> yeah, pug wash. Uh, anybody know where pug wash is? In Nova Scotia. It's a little fishing village. Uh, no, so right near the Brunswick border. In the 1957, a guy, Cyrus Eaton, who made a fortune in the States, came back and got together, through the influence of great scientists, 20 of the world nuclear physicists to discuss how to control nuclear weapons and ultimately set the groundwork for not only non-proliferation, but disarmament. And it's been ongoing since then. And we, it's got a youth movement, it's worldwide. But it hasn't been overly effective. 
Because, ladies and gentlemen, in the last 20 years of the peace dividend after the Cold War, the developed world has spent nearly a trillion in modernizing nuclear weapons. An absolutely useless piece of equipment. Totally. And that's what's ongoing. So the environment, yeah, it's a revolution. But we're nowhere near really grasping it because we're wasting our cash on things that could destroy it. Yes. Ultimately, massively. And so that's one of the revolutions that is more and more coming to the fore. And the vulnerability is sensed by the youth more than ever time before. Because the second revolution, which is the information revolution, is making them aware. That technology is going to permit people to Skype the world. You can sit in a high school or primary school here, you set up a computer, a solar panel, and a satellite link, and you can Skype kids in one of the most impoverished countries of the world, and these kids can look at them and say, hey, they're human like me. Jeez, look at them. They're laughing. Look at their conditions. You can actually create communications in the world. And they know how to maximize it. 12-year-olds know how to maximize. They can, it, and we've seen its use. We've seen in Tunisia how the youth led that revolution and how the elders there showed enormous deference to them for having been able to bring about that revolution using that technology and the coalescing of them. And so they're into it. Problem is, is where is it going? And I threw Google there just to, or is Google up there? It's not there. What happens if Google goes rogue? <laughs> Who's controlling Google? What's the, what's the world body controlling really Google? There's a fight between the library of Harvard and Google because Google can now put, uh, digitize all other print material, including all scientific data, and there are no restrictions on what it does. So we can fiddle with the books. And Google's but the first of those big instruments out there. And we're dependent on it. We're getting suckered into it. And we're not grasping what ultimately it can and might be able to very subtly do. So it's a revolution that's still embryonic, ladies and gentlemen. We're still learning about how to maximize these systems. And the other one is the security one that came about very much by the end of the Cold War. And it made us very much aware that out there, there's nothing more than purely the Eurocentric uh, security uh, that we had concentrated on for so long. We had millions of people in uniform, facing millions of people in uniform in Europe. Millions to protect each other. And in 2004, when I was at the Kennedy School starting my research on child soldiers, we had a forum there, and the question was, what do we do with Darfur? And I came up with a proposal of about 44,000 troops to provide just protection to those camps, let alone bring the people back. And I got Snickers, not the chocolate bar. <laughs> and I said, why are you snickering? Why is it impossible to have 44,000 troops go into Darfur when we had two and a half million 15 years ago defending us in Europe? Where'd they all go? The other guy had three and a half million. And that doesn't count the mobilization base. Where's all that gone? To protect ourselves, there seemed to be no limit. But to protect others, there's all kinds of constraints. And we create them. And we let the political elite get away with that. And so poverty is the major source of friction in the world, fighting poverty. We've seen ethnic cleansing and genocide. We've seen terrorism and extremism. That's come close to home and its impact. And of course, nuclear weapons are still there. And if we think those two towers coming down is bad, wait for that first little grapefruit tactical nuclear device to go up and take out Toronto. You think we panicked then? We ain't seen nothing yet. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in this era where we are seeing massive movements of people, we're seeing massive destructions of human beings, 
on scales that go beyond any comprehension. The question is, what is our engagement? We, the haves, we of the 20% of humanity of the haves, who are working very hard to get to Mars by mastering our technology and saying that humanity is advancing when in fact 80% of humanity is living in inhuman conditions around the world. And if we don't realize that we have that responsibility, then why do we speak of humanity? Why don't we speak then of categorizing human beings? Why don't we in fact come more overt and say, yeah, we sent 67,000 troops to Yugoslavia, and we pulled all the troops out of Rwanda, even though there were more people killed, injured, internally displaced, refugee than raped in 100 days in Rwanda than the six years of Yugoslavia. And we're still in Yugoslavia. We took that decision. There were criteria that weren't used. And are those criteria criteria that are ethically responsible. Can we actually say that we believe in that criteria, that our politicians can take those decisions, that we let them take those decisions, and that's okay. That's appropriate. That's acceptable. Well, in this complex era, those who are being hit the most are the children. Because in many societies, many of these imploding nations, over 50% of the population is under the age of 18. And look at the scale of these children. These are no more on the sidelines. In civil wars, ladies and gentlemen, in conflicts, in imploding nations, the civilian population is both a prize of war and an instrument of war. In Rwanda, the extremists decided to wipe out 1.2 million Tutsis in order to maintain power. And they implemented and killed 700,000 of them, plus 100,000 of their own who were too reconciliatory. And they were working towards the end when they were stopped by the rebel forces. But the extremists then moved 3.9 million people into refugee camps and displaced camps as a power base for negotiations. So the civilian population in the concept that we have our Euro or World War II stories where we see the sort of refugees on the roads and being protected as the soldiers are fighting on the, on the sidelines, hey, the real reality of World War II with civilians is the Holocaust. The real reality of World War II is not only destruction of the buildings, but all the people who were inside those buildings, the Dresdens and so on. And in this era, it is not the military that is the primary objective, it's the civilians. And how you use them, how you manipulate them, how you instill fear. And that's why new weapons were invented in this time frame. One of the new weapons is called rape. You say, hey, that's not a new weapon. Yes, it is. It used to be something that was used uh, that rogue soldiers on the sidelines would abuse in conflicts and so on. But in Rwanda and in many of the civil conflicts going on, they deliberately create rape sites. They deliberately create rape sites to rape young women, girls. And why do they do that? because they want to create horror. They want to break down the social structure of cohesiveness of the people. And they break down the, that structure through horror, which instills fear. And so through rape, they are able to manipulate the population and emasculate its ability to respond. In 2005, when I was sent in by Prime Minister Martin to look at Canada's involvement in Darfur, and we were moving a whole bunch of stuff down there, I met 
uh, with the governor of one of the states who said that rape doesn't exist in Darfur. And we knew it was being used as an instrument. The <coughs> militia were impregnating women in African-based Darfurians in order to create another race. This is getting pretty extreme. This is reality. This is a weapon being used. And the other weapon being used is the child soldier. We define it as a child or youth under the age of 18. That is not allowed to be trained, equipped, armed, and used in conflict. And that comes from the optional protocol on child rights uh, and the um, uh, child rights uh, convention. And so how widespread is this problem? Is this something that sort of happens every now and again? Or is it a significant threat out there? And I'm going to go faster in order to, to get through the right points. Look at those numbers. Look at the last line. 40% of child soldiers are girls. In 2001, when I went in, I was working for the Minister Sita at the time, part-time, and I went in to Sierra Leone with another of our colleagues, Phil Lancaster, to try to get children out of the rebel forces. I could demobilize 10 boys for every girl, because girls are far more useful than boys. Boys uh, do the shooting and killing, yes, but the girls not only do that, but they also, in those male-dominated societies, run the bivouacs, are the logistics train, and they're also the sex slaves and the bushwives. And so when it comes to demobilizing them, you're into a different scenario because their societies recognize that the boy was doing, well, the sort of warrior thing, and the community takes them back, the families take them back, they cleanse them. Yeah, there are cases where they, they've been abused, but they, they try to bring them back, and they're acceptable. But the girls are not. Because they've been abused, they're not taken back. And they probably have one or two children on top of that. So it's a crime against humanity to recruit and use child soldiers, but there's a sin behind it. And the sin is, is when you try to meet up with these girls in order to commence rehabilitation, you've got an incredible wall because the girls actually feel guilty of having been abused. So strong is the cultural taboo of women being abused uh, outside of wedlock or being, being uh, uh, engaged outside of wedlock. So they actually feel guilty. And they're sitting there with a sick child. And they're 14. And they've been child soldier for four years. And that's what the adults have created. And used and continue to use today, even though the campaign started uh, with Russia Michelle in working in 1986 is trying to get and move these. Uh, these are some of the countries that use them. Either the state employs them or the uh, non-state actors employ them. And yeah, some are not only forcibly recruited, some volunteer. But it is the reasons for volunteering, really volunteering, seeking safety, seeking food, having been abandoned, families destroyed, villages destroyed. They simply just pick them up. So they either raid a village or they simply pick them up as they're aimlessly moving around and use them and indoctrinate them and drug them up and hold them by fear. And so in this time, of enormous poverty in those countries, of desperation and total alienation. It is not surprising that the numbers of children available are in the millions. So it's not a problem of getting recruits, just about picking and choosing them and hauling them in. And when they're injured, you throw them away.